Euh, mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir et bienvenue au vernissage de la nouvelle série euh, Recherche en lumière de l'École de, de musique Schulich. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural session of Research Live at the Schulich School of Music. Uh, je m'appelle Stephen McAdams et je suis professeur en recherche musicale et j'ai co-organisé uh, cette série avec Kit Soden, qui est un doctorant en composition. Uh, my name is Stephen McAdams, and I'm a professor of music research here, and I co-curated this uh, series with uh, Kit Soden, who's a composition student here at McGill. Um, and we want to thank, first of all, the, the dean of the Schulich School of Music for making this possible. It's a new initiative, and we hope it will continue for, for years to come. Uh, the public face of the Schulich School of Music consists in large majority of performances by our excellent faculty and students, uh, musicians, occasionally performing works of some of our own composers, and that is all very well and good, but it doesn't fully represent what actually goes on in the music faculty, and one of the things that goes on here is research, so one might ask the question, what is music research? Uh, so the aim of this series is to bring alive the research in music theory, music history and musicology, music education and sound recording, as well as the many faces of musical science and engineering that fall under the rubric of music technology, including musical acoustics, sound analysis and synthesis, music information retrieval, digital musical instruments, and in my case, music perception and cognition. But even in the case of performance and composition, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and before the final product arrives at your ears that also involves research. And so one of the things we're going to try to do over the next few years is to also show how the research gives rise to things like opera, as we'll see this evening. Uh, each event will be presented by a member of the Schulich School, and uh, the idea is to bring to light their research, amply illustrated with musical examples, and ending with a small piece to tie it all together. So our motto is, in line with the motto of the school this year, bring alive the research with music. Uh, this season will start today with the many kinds of intelligences that are operative in opera performance and production with Professor Patrick Hansen, Director of Opera McGill, and student baritone Bruno Roy. On Friday, uh, January 15th, Professor Peter Schubert, a music theorist, will take us on a journey back to the 16th century and into the minds of composers and vocal improvisers with a group of student singers. And on Thursday, February 18th, uh, Professor Alain Caz and myself will present a pre-concert talk with the full McGill uh, Wind Symphony on stage. Uh, and the idea there will be to reveal some of the perceptual mysteries behind the marvelous sonic richness achieved by composers who sculpt musical timbre uh, through orchestration techniques. And finally, to end this inaugural season, Professor George Massenberg, a world-renowned sound recordist and developer of recording technologies, and also the person who handles all of the video and webcasting here at the school, uh, will delve into the intricacies of what, make, what it takes to make a Grammy-winning recording. Uh, and there will be a live combo on stage that will allow him to do that. So we hope to see you at all of these events, which we have conceived to be fun, informative, and artistically and scientifically exhilarating. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Patrick Hansen and Bruno Roy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Stephen. Really excited to uh, be here to talk about intelligence and opera in the same uh, uh, afternoon. Um, so uh, it's very exciting. If any of you out there are singers, you will feel so smart at the end of this. You will feel very like, oh my, I had no idea I was that adept. Um, I'm going to be helped this afternoon uh, by Bruno Roy, who is a master's degree student here. Bruno um, uh, got his bachelor's degree, uh, studied with Winston Purdy, um, is now studying with Ben Hepner. And uh, he just received the third place prize in the Canadian Opera Company voice competition just a few weeks ago. And um, we, yeah. And uh, we're going to use a case study. We're going to use one aria from Carmen by Bizet, Escamillo's aria, the Toreador song. Um, 
I'm hoping many people know this. If not, you will know it by the end of the talk. Um, the Multiple Intelligences of Opera is based on a theory um, purported by Howard Gardner, who was a Harvard professor. He was born in 1943. When he was 40 years old, he uh, published this book called The Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. Um, he was trying to show that intelligence was not about IQ, or intelligent quotient, not about looking at a test score, standardized tests, and the scores that they generate to show someone is you know, smarter than somebody else. He thought, um, he created this idea that there were, um, intelligence was a combination of modalities, and that these modalities were interactive and at play with each other, and some people were just more adept at them than others. Um, this is a, a theory that is slightly criticized by those sort of IQ folk um, because of its lack of empirical evidence. Um, that it's very hard to kind of ascertain this. Also because he, replace, he replaces words like aptitude and ability with the word intelligence. Um, but uh, I believe that it provides a wider understanding of the definition of intelligence, and that's a nice picture of um, Professor Gardner. Um, these are his eight modalities. Now originally there were seven. He added the eighth one in, in the 90s, in 1995. So we have a musical modality, um, linguistic or verbal, mathematical, logical. We have body kinesthetic, spatial or visual, interpersonal and intrapersonal. And then he added the naturalistic. Um, I'm gonna be talking about all of these except for the naturalistic. Opera is not natural. <laughs> um, um, operatic intelligence, really. Do you, Bruno, this, are you surprised we're talking about operatic intelligence? I mean, I would be surprised if we were talking about tenors. Oh my, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, a sense of humor is not one of those intelligences, but hey, uh, I guess that goes into interpersonal intelligence. Um, operatic intelligence, um, there's a lot at work when a singer is singing an, a moment on the stage. So uh, when singers get to a moment uh, where time kind of slows down and they want to express one emotion or they're trying to introduce themselves, uh, we call this an aria. And um, at that moment in time, they are doing what I call juggling. They have a lot of different um, balls in the air, and their hands can't touch each one of them, um, or all of them at the same time. So they have to keep many of them in the air, and they have to kind of um, touch base from time to time. And those, those sort of, that juggling act um, is a part of this operatic intelligence. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this aria and we're going to break it down to these different modalities, piece by piece and show you each one of them in, from an individual standpoint. So um, an, an opera singer is creating a vocal line uh, with their little vocal folds. They are projecting text. They are on a set. Sometimes these sets are, look like mountains. Sometimes they are raked. Sometimes they are jagged. Um, there's very dim lighting sometimes. Uh, they're in a costume. They are handling props. Sometimes they've got a uh, sword fight, sword play. Sometimes there's stage combat. Uh, they're communicating with other singers. They're also communicating with the conductor. They are listening back to the orchestra's communication. Um, they're being heard without a microphone uh, in a very large space. They're telegraphing emotions into a very large theater. Uh, they are pacing, if this is a long roll, uh, opera, there's the, the, the uh, phrase, opera is, uh, life is short, opera is long. Um, and uh, that is true. Um, uh, but uh, pacing a long roll. Um, and then acting in a foreign language. These are just a few that I sort of came off, up with off the top of my head. Um, so that's a lot to kind of think about um, all at the same time. Um, now I'm gonna break this down a little bit. Musical intelligence. This is Lara Chukavich singing loudly. Um, and uh, in Alcina, a production we did here about nine years ago. Um, an incredibly intelligent singer. And um, the, the idea that music um, can come from a human being <laughs> uh, and with such power is a, a real special thing. And here at Opera McGill, we have students who are trying to train themselves uh, and they're studying voice, they're studying musicianship, they're studying theory, they're studying history, uh, they're in, uh, doing research. Um, they're trying to put all these different components together so that they can go out and be a professional opera singer. Um, opera is just 
has, you know, is just one component, actually, of uh, what they're learning here at the Schulich School of Music. Um, I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about musical intelligence. Um, music, of course, can heal. And um, music is uh, a basis of um, a couple of old Greek myths. So Apollo is the god of music. He was also the god of healing. Um, the Chinese character Yao, um, the, those top two lines down there, that sort of herbal, I think represents the, the weeds used in herbal medicine. The bottom part of that means music. So the Chinese character for music is the base for the character of medicine. Here in modern times, it's been shown, of course, that uh, music can be used for therapy, music can heal, and there's uh, great new studies out there for um, looking at uh, ways of uh, helping to treat Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and PTSD, and autism through music. And they are proving that it improves cognition and mood. So I don't think it's, it's, it's one that we take for granted as musicians. Uh, that, oh yeah, we can read music, oh, we, can, we can hum a tune, we can remember it. But it's, it's actually a, a, a fundamental, beautiful, wondrous thing. So, how, what, what I think uh, musical intelligence is about um, is for musicians, the ability to think in music, hear and recognize patterns and manipulate them physically by playing or singing or mentally by memorizing or composing. So this is like people who can hear music in their heads. Um, uh, people who can hear music and then play it on the piano. I remember very vividly a, a former student here, Jordan D'Souza, who heard the opera Turandot once and went to the piano and then played it, all of it. <laughs> um, it was amazing. But uh, part also of musical intelligence is figuring out how to build the instrument. Pianists, we don't have to build our instrument. It comes, it's here, it arrives. I don't carry it around with me either. Singers, however, have to build their instrument while they are trying to learn to play their instrument. So building an instrument is also about um, building your vocal range. Now, what that, for, um, for a man, men have uh, rather large ranges because we have something called a falsetto. So, uh, like, forgive me. That's sort of the, the range of the voice for a, a strange man. Um, and uh, I have like a counter bass voice, I think. Um, so uh, we have the bass, and then we have the baritone, which Bruno was a baritone, the tenor, and then we have the counter tenor, and falsetto, um, so that's what range is. Um, Bruno, though, has actually been working on his vocal technique, and um, he is going to demonstrate a little teeny tiny bit about his, his warm-ups and his vocalises that he does. There's many vocalises I'm not going to teach much to any of the singers that are here, really about uh, warming up and whatnot, but you know, there's many things we can do, tongue trills, just to get the support going on pitch or off pitch, um, vowel exercises. It might have been a little low for me to start at, but um, <laughs> basically the idea to find the resonance in the vowels that we'll then use and bring to the language that we sing. Yeah. Do you do a lot of warm-up? Probably not as much as I should, <laughs> but t typically if 10 to 15 minutes before a good rehearsal or um, a work session is what I would what I would work What you do? Yeah. Um, of course, they, um, these singers a lot of times also have to learn to uh, read a new language. Uh, many singers start singing before they can read music. It's a little different than pianists or uh, uh, some other instrumentalists. Um, singers can make noise. Everybody can sing. And uh, they sing when they're children. They sing in choirs. They sing in church. And then they find they have a voice. Someone says, oh, you should study voice. And then they go to study voice, and they realize there's another language and it's called music. Um, and so they have to develop the ability to read another language and also hear it in their head. Here is the full score, the first page to the uh, uh, Torridor song. Now, um, it's uh, written in 1875 by Georges Bizet. Um, I counted these notes. There are 1,303 notes in the first 15 seconds. Um, there are about 40 plus players in an orchestra that are gonna play in this Carmen. That's 250 fingers, because of course, violinists don't use 10 fingers, they use, you know, half. Um, 
The entire aria has about 22,000 notes in it, and the entire opera has about a million. I extrapolated that by doing math. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> that's a lot of information that we process for one opera. Uh, it's, it's a lot of information to be processed, actually, for one aria, 22,000 notes. Um, and that does not include dynamic markings or articulation markings or uh, the text. <laughs> it's just the notes. So you go to an opera, a conductor has conducted. For most operas, they're about three hours long, about a million notes. I think that's kind of uh, cool. I feel much better being a conductor uh, knowing that. This is the same piece. So here we have the full score. We have a flute, another flute, doubling piccolo, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two horns, and C, two trumpets, three trombones, a timpani, and a triangle, very important. Um, a group of violins, a group of second violins, a group of violas, um, and then a group of cellos and a group of basses. That's how that looks. Also, in this piece, you have to have Escamillo himself. You need Frasquita, Mercedes, Carmen, um, Zuniga, Morales, and a whole chorus. <laughs> Then this is the same thing. <laughs> um, this is what's called a piano reduction. Um, it's just uh, much less. It's about 10% less information. Um, 123 notes. 10 fingers. Yeah. So this basically sounds like this. He comes in. Um, so that's what us rehearsal pianists do. We take um, those uh, thousand notes and cut it down uh, to be able to play it on the piano. Um, so musical intelligence, obviously you need it to be an opera singer. <laughs> Linguistic intelligence, this is my favorite slide. Um, this is from our production of Imeneo. Um, and uh, uh, linguistic intelligence, of course, is the other component of, of opera when people think about opera, which is music and text. Um, linguistic intelligence uh, of writers, poets, polyglots, people who speak more than you know, three or four languages, understanding both the literal and figurative meanings of words, the capacity to use language to express ideas verbally or via the written word. This makes a great deal of sense. So operatic languages, um, a lot of times people think, oh, Italian, French, German, what else is there? Well, <laughs> practically every language on the earth we sing in, our opera has been translated into, including Swahili. English, Spanish, Russian, Czech, Hungarian, Polish, Latin. Those are the, the main groups that we deal with. Um, of course, this text oftentimes is poetic in nature. So um, there, there's poetry involved, which means there's symbolism involved, which means there's metaphor and allegory, and so it's, it's, not, just, it's not just words telling a story. Um, this linguistic text also needs to be uh, spoken sometimes by people who do not speak the language. Many, oftentimes, if you go to see an opera, there'll be people on the stage and they will not speak the language that they are singing in. Uh, now, hopefully they will know every word that they are singing, they will have really worked hard on what they're doing, but it is difficult to be fluent in all of those languages I just mentioned. There are some people, but difficult. Um, so they work very hard to get their tongue in play. And this linguistic intelligence is really important for a, uh, a young singer and a student who's going to be working on uh, operas and songs in many different languages. Like currently, you did an opera in English, you've done operas in Italian, uh, you're singing German next week, um, and, uh, that, and of course this is in French. So um, I was wondering if you would speak a little bit of this poetry for Absolutely. us. Votre toast, je peux vous le rendre, Seigneur, Seigneur, car avec les soldats, oui, les toreros peuvent s'entendre, pour plaisir, ils ont les combats. Le cirque est plein ces jours de fête, le cirque est plein du haut en bas. Les spectateurs s'interpellent à grand fracas, apostrophes, cris et tapages, poussés jusqu'à la fureur, car c'est la fête du courage, c'est la fête des gens de cœur. Allons en garde Torreador, <laughs> on guard. That's the part you guys probably know. Um, yeah, so um, you also need to know the meaning of that text. Do you speak French? I think so. Yes. 
Okay, so um, it's pretty easy. Now, when you are in, uh, when you're singing in French, your uh, your mind is in French. You're not translating. You're just in French. When you sing in English, are you in English or are you trans? Yes. yes. German. No. Do you translate into French? Um, I tend to not translate into French. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, so. Um, but many people, if you're up, up here and giunse il fine il momento, che coturò senza fanno, in braccio al idol mio, timide cure, uscite dal mio petto. That's some Italian, Susanna from Le Nozze di Figaro, and um, uh, I can sort of tell you exactly what that means within the context of 18th century Italian. Um, but uh, the other thing that's important about text is not just how it sounds out of your mouth, but the meaning of it. And this is part of this linguistic, linguistic intelligence, is to be able to imbue the meaning of the text. So you're not just uh, rambling off a grocery list of words and sounds and diction. Um, and that's tricky. In opera, we also have to get the meaning of the subtext. So uh, if you were going to say, Torre ador en garde, um, when in the meaning of the subtext. What is the subtext of sort of that? I mean, for, for those who don't speak French, what is the meaning of the text for that first verse of the aria? Torreado, be ready. Be ready. For what? Because the toro is coming for you. The bull is coming for you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, are, are you singing to any specific person? I think I'm singing to the ladies. Yes. The yeah, so, yes. And so the bull is coming. The bull is coming. So there's a little bit of subtext in that. Um, uh, there's a lot of sexual subtext in opera. That's why it sells. Um, and why people came in the 1790s and the 1820s. Um, they came to see things on the stage that they might read about in private, but they could see in public. Um, and it was there. Mozart operas are, f are, are imbued with uh, sexual uh, connotations and subtext um, in both the music and the text. So the, uh, the next one is logical mathematical intelligence, and that is when we, this is an actual score, um, it's not a made up thing. Um, this is when actual music and text get put together through what's called rhythm, um, and the way the composer sets the text to the musical, to the music. So a lot of times people think about logic and math as something that is the, is the domain of scientists um, because th they have the capacity to reason, solve equations, mathematical problems, achieve high scores on IQ tests, uh, to reason and to calculate. So we, we think of logical mathematical uh, minds as not being necessarily connected to musicians. But frankly, um, the, as musicians in the house will tell you, um, we find a great correlation between uh, math and music. Um, it's, we have to count when we're singing um, and when we're conducting and when we're playing. And sometimes we're counting past four. It's very exciting. Um, sometimes we have to count to seven. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then start again. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's bold and fabulous. But uh, rhythm is, uh, I call rhythm the spine of the opera because um, rhythm is what the text is really attached to. Uh, a lot of times young singers, when they go after a new opera or kind of a 20th century piece, 21st century piece, they go after the pitches, they go after the music. And we work really hard to try to stop that and to try to get them to go after the spine, to find the inner core of the music, which is the rhythm and how the words are set. So uh, <coughs> saying the words in rhythm is really the first step to conquering a difficult piece. Um, time signatures. Um, this is not a hard piece. Uh, the underlying rhythm of this piece It's a pretty simple rhythm. Um, it's an exciting rhythm. Um, Carmen is uh, officially an Italian grand opera sung in French set in Spain based on some Cuban dance rhythms. Uh, it's sort of a, some of our first world music we had. Um, and uh, this is definitely uh, a Spanish flavor to, to, to the uh, Escamillo. Um, conducting. 
conductors, I can't really talk about conductors and intelligence uh, in the same afternoon, um, but conducting is really controlling music with uh, no instrument. <laughs> Um, they don't play instruments. I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but they, they're, not, they're not making any sounds. Sometimes they grunt, sometimes they, they, they sweat, um, sometimes they smile or they yell, but they're not making, they're not making noise. Um, this piece is in four, four, four. There are four beats per bar. So one, two, three, four. Nice and easy. It's actually pretty easy to conduct this piece. Nothing tricky. You go, down, you go to the left, you go to the right, and then you come back up again. That's all they're doing. Um, they get paid, let's, we'll all do this right now. And down, left, right, up. Down, left, right, up. Simple, yeah. Simple, simple, simple. <laughs> Musical intelligence for all of you out there. There's a melody. Sing the melody without rhythm, if that's There's possible. No rhythm. That'll be yeah. difficult, but yeah. I'll try. <laughs> And then we put the music with the rhythm. This is, this is the simple part of the uh, exam. Uh, here we go. Two, three, four. Do, re, a, do, ga, de, do, re, a, do, do, re, a, do. Yeah. Sound uh, feasible for y'all to do? The words are do, re, a, do, re, a, do. Yeah, and you put in French uh, opera at the time, you would say, en garde. You take the end, you actually sing the schwa at the end. So uh, let's all sing that once. Two, three, four. Yeah, when the time comes, I will be waving my hands at you and ask you to sing uh, when we put all this together. Um, so those components are the sort of like, yeah, of course we know that. There's musical intelligence. Yes, there's linguistic. Yes, there's, we have to put it together with mathematical and um, logical means. Um, that all makes sense. Then we come to some others that are um, interesting components of uh, an opera singer's toolbox. One is kinesthetic intelligence, body, body intelligence. Um, uh, this is a tree from Alcina. Uh, um, kinesthetic intelligence. When we think of this, we think of d about dancers, we think about athletes, we think about Olympic divers, figure skaters. They, these are people who have a clear sense of timing and goals for physical actions, uh, the ability to sense physical patterns and replicate them, the capacity to move through space. So in opera land, this is a huge part of what we do. Uh, gestures. Gestures are things that our bodies do naturally. People talk with their hands. Italians really love to talk with their hands. Some people don't talk with their hands. Um, on the operatic stage, we have to plan our gestures. There are sort of two kinds of gestures. One is an indirect gesture. The world is a big place. The world is an indirect place, so I use an indirect gesture. You. I love you. That's a direct thing. So, the world is a big place that could be used. I love you. That could also be used. <laughs> but you have, to connect the, you have to connect the reason for the gesture with actual, the actual subject on the stage. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing this is that we are trying to communicate over a very large space. Um, sometimes if you've been to the opera house, you've seen a little teeny tiny person with a head and sort of arms. <laughs> and you kind of see a head and arms and you see them moving. You can't see their face sometimes. So um, opera singers have to learn to gesture. Gestures also have a beginning and a middle and an end. 
They begin somewhere below the waist. They rise. They come up into a middle section. And then they disperse. And they have to end. You'll see a lot of times uh, young singers or singers who haven't thought about their gestures with hands that start to float. And they stay there. And in their heads, they're thinking, oh my god, my hand. What am I doing with it? I can't get it down. Ugh. Gesturing for this character, what do you think those would be about, these gestures? Well, in the aria, he's kind of giving a toast right at the beginning. So I guess a toast gesture would be appropriate. Yes, that one would help, yes. He is also a matador, so he would probably show what he would do in the ring mm -hmm. with his jacket, perhaps. Yeah. And um, he might also gesture to specific people in the room mm -hmm. or hushing everyone. Do you plan your way. gestures? I try to. Yeah. Something, see, some things just come. Some things I, do. Yeah. Do you have like a physicality that you sort of go to that's sort of like Bruno 101, you know? <laughs> well, ideally you wouldn't want to have that. You would want to be involved in the character enough to not be just yourself and then adding on things to that. Yes. So, so while, you are, while you have your vocal technique and going with your breathing and making sound, while you are tracking the musical score, while you've got the text coming out of your mouth with a rhythm that's working with the conductor who's in five or seven or four, you're also thinking about what your body is doing in space. Um, this also then connects with facial expressions. Um, uh, opera has changed a little bit. We have cameras, hi, um, that come up close into the face. And uh, people are having to sort of think about what they look like while they sing. Singers make great faces. Sometimes to get the sound out. Um, they have to kind of think about that now when they have the camera coming in close. Um, I remember when I first saw uh, the most fantastic mezzo coloratura mezzo soprano I've heard in, you know, in probably in my lifetime, Cecilia Bartoli, who, um, a fantastic, fantastic singer, who was making these very interesting faces while she sang. And we were all like, wow, what's going on? Um, it was very apparent that these were helping her make that incredible sound. Um, those have sort of changed a little bit with time. Um, she's just one example. Um, these facial expressions um, are also about how you're trying to communicate the text and the meaning of the text. So even though in a large, large, large opera house you can't necessarily see the face, you can on the stage see the face. And that face is a very important face when you're trying to communicate text to somebody else. Um, it's also about eye contact. Um, and it also many times, oftentimes, kinesthetic intelligence is about two or three or 60 people in space when you have a large chorus. You have to work through them. You have to have all these people moving in, in, in a natural way so that it looks like they're in, a, in, in a Lilith Pastia's tavern. Um, but there's 60 of them, and they're all moving around, getting ready for Escamillo's entrance. He comes down. He has to probably get up on top of a table to sing. Somebody has to hand him a glass. And all of this stuff is really mostly based on kinesthetic awareness um, and how that's going. Posture is also incredibly important. Um, a lot of times it's connected to the vocal technique. It's hard to sing with your head off your shoulders. Um, but a lot of times when you're trying to show age, there is a physicality to the age. And it all has to work still within a head that's on shoulders with a throat that's kind of open. Um, <clears throat> these singers can't uh, contort themselves and still make huge sounds. Um, have you ever, ever been asked to sing on the floor, upside down, on your head? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. You have? Uh, not by me? Not by you. Yeah. No. I, yeah. Yeah, although I have. Um, <laughs> there's an opera where uh, the baritone actually has to sing uh, being, he's uh, hung by his feet. Um, he has to sing upside down. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, but uh, 
these sort of postures can help create character. It can show us the age of the person. It can also show social uh, interactions and the social stature of a person. The aristocrats on stage are going to hold themselves differently than the peasants on stage. And all of this uh, kinesthetic intelligence is a part of their creation of the character. A bunch of men floating, um, <laughs> dancing. Um, dancing is a huge part of opera. Um, here we have, uh, I think, terrific examples of facial, um, facial expression. Over here, these two, this two, these, this couple on this side, that couple on that side, um, and that's that's a moment of of great kinesthetic intelligence, I think. Um, Close on the heels of kinesthetic intelligence is spatial intelligence. Uh, spatial intelligence, this is a, a, a little model of a set for Fiat Regiment. Um, and we have to work a great deal of time in a two-dimensional space in opera. Um, spatial intelligence really for designers, artists, architects, of course, uh, more than just the visual, imagining 3D spaces in two dimensionals, uh, two dimensional media. Uh, discerning the similarities across diverse domains includes the use of abstract analytical abilities. Um, I love this William Blake uh, quote, the mind sees through the eye. Um, uh, spatial, there's a lot of space in opera. Um, something a lot of people don't think about is the form and structure of music. Um, it creates a type of space, an architectural framework for how we live in an opera. For instance, this aria, the Toyder song, which we will, we will get to it, um, it is in a, in a certain kind of form. There is an introduction, which I played. Then there is the verse, first verse. And then there is what we call the chorus. It repeats, back to the intro, the second verse, and then the chorus again. And then there's a little tag at the end. And that's the aria. That's the framework for this song. Um, that's the space that we are working in. Um, this is also uh, connected to the idea of a person's kinesphere and physical agility. Uh, Bruno, would you mind standing up? So on the operatic stage, we all have kinespheres. It is um, as sort of as far as you can go. It's a bubble around you. So this, you know, mine is about this big. Um, yours is how big? Yeah. Come on, come on, let's stretch out. Yeah, yeah, come on. yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. So, when two people's kinespheres on the operatic stage mingle, I'm in his space. This is what we call the kiss or the kill moment. When operatic singers get close, we're either unk or we're unk. And it's a kinespheric, it's a, it's, a, it's a sense of yourself and your, your, your space. Um, I think cities have different senses of kinespheres. <laughs> Um, there are certain cities where you feel that the kinespheres of people are very large, and then certain cities were very, very small. Um, but uh, it, it is an awareness that happens. It's an intelligence that happens on the stage. Some people are just very much aware of their body space. You've all met these people who are not. They come right up next to you online at the grocery store. <laughs> In opera, this is an odd thing to happen. It's a sort of a funny thing, strange thing, uncomfortable thing but it's, uh, it would be a choice. So on the operatic stage, we're very much aware of, of these kinespheres. Um, of course, sword fights. Have you done sword fighting? No. Stage combat? Yes. Yes. So um, that's all fun. Everybody loves that stuff. So, um, but it's actually stage combat is much more about spatial intelligence, I think, than kinesthetic intelligence. Yes, there's a choreography to it, but you have to really be aware. No one is actually striking anybody on the stage. They have to be very aware of the space that they are using. Um, of course, we stage in two dimensions. So, for instance, this is uh, 
this is the ground plan for Midsummer Night's Dream that we produced a couple of years ago. Um, and this is what the designer uh, you know, brings to the director. The director looks at this and figures out where everybody's going to be sort of based on this ground plan. Um, sometimes you get to see what it might look like, a little sketch. Um, and then you have to, with a great deal of imagination, imagine what it will turn out to be. This is a picture in rehearsal in a piano tech of, of that space. So when we rehearse, here we rehearse in this wonderful place called the Worth Opera Studio, down in negative two um, level. We tape out this ground plan. See all those stairs? <laughs> we tape out the stairs. So when people are singing, they're looking down on the ground, trying to figure out where they are. And they may be standing on a platform 18 feet tall, and the person here will be standing down on the floor. And so there's a great deal of imagining the three dimensions for the singer. Um, and it's really actually quite important. Um, and that, that really affects the design of the opera. Um, also imagining your costumes when you look at the sketch and trying to figure out what, what, what is your costume going to look like. Um, of course, there's acoustic space. That's what's missing here in, in this lecture is the acoustic space of a big opera house. Um, there are also other live performance things that are missing. Um, the orchestra, uh, a huge audience. Sets, props, costumes, lighting cues, haze, sound effects, cannons going off. Um, all of that is imagined in the rehearsal room. So uh, spatial intelligence is something that uh, is worked on. Um, between kinesphere and spatial, uh, kinesthetic and spatial intelligence, I mean, where would you say you're, you lie stronger, Bruno? The spatial, probably, most probably. Yeah. The more you rehearse in situations like that, mm -hmm. the more adept you become at it. Yes. Yeah. And the only way to really become adept sometimes with the kinesthetic stuff is to have experiential uh, learning processes in place where you get performance opportunities. So now we get to the uh, couple of fun ones. Um, the interpersonal intelligence. So uh, this is a, a choreography session um, for the Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, interpersonal intelligence uh, we find oftentimes with teachers, leaders, collaborative artists, pianists, conductors, directors, um, deans, prime ministers, uh, politicians. Understanding, that didn't get a joke at all, uh, didn't get a laugh at all, sorry. Uh, understanding and relating to others, being able to interact and interpret, uh, and, and interpret others. The ability to recognize distinctions between people, to react to their facial and body language. Instinctive understanding of emotions, having empathy, motives and feelings. Um, this is, uh, this is a, an ability and intelligence that uh, is sometimes uh, really lacking in people. The ability to really listen to someone and hear the meaning of what they're saying. To understand, are they hurting inside while they, when you say, how are you doing? I'm fine. Are they really? Can you, there are people who can really hear the subtext, of the truth of what they're saying. And uh, this uh, sort of this ability to listen, this ability to collaborate with another human being uh, is, is incredibly important to opera because um, it's the most collaborative art form I know. Uh, you need to, as an opera uh, producer, you need to be able to collaborate with every single person that you see on the stage and every single pers person you s that's behind the stage. Um, you, as a singer, you have to collaborate with lots of people. You have to collaborate with your colleagues, who in the uh, Opera McGill, they're, former, they're students, they're your fellow students. Um, you're collaborating with conductors and directors and stage managers, costume designers who are putting you in a costume that might make you look fat or might make you feel ugly or um, it could also make you feel incredibly exposed. Um, they are people who are saying, you know, what I really need you to do, I need you to, um, like, shave your head and appear like topless and all in leather. And um, I was going to show you a picture of that, but uh, 
because they're all over opera now, but uh, Bruno wouldn't allow me to do that. So, oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this collaboration, this, this interaction happens outside of the opera. So outside of Carmen, outside of the Escamillo R aria, um, Bruno has going to be, is going to be collaborating with so many people just for this one little moment. Um, and most, the most important collaboration is probably the conductor. Because if the conductor takes off, or it changes things. And there's not much you can do about it sometimes. Sometimes you can. Just imagine. Sing a little bit. You're sort of done now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the opposite of that. Um, <clears throat> So when we do this, I don't say, Bruno, this is the tempo. This is what's going to happen. This is how I'm going to play it. I play what I think, and then I listen, and then I adjust. I'm like, oh, I'm a little too fast. Oh, I should slow down. Or eh, he wants it to go a little slower. Or oh, he wants to go a little faster. So you adjust. <clears throat> and so it's an interactive now that has to happen with this interpersonal. A lot of it is listening. Some of it is watching. Some of it's feeling, but that's, the, uh, that's that interaction there. Then, of course, there's all of that interpersonal uh, intelligence that one needs in the opera. <laughs> so, Bruno, it's, it's two things. There's Bruno Hua, who is collaborating with the conductor in the orchestra and collaborating with um, uh, designers and set designers and directors to create this role. And then there's the role itself of Escamillo, who is having interpersonal relationships with characters on the stage, with Carmen. She's there. He sees her. He wants her. She wants him. And they have to get that. There's no text for this, of course. Um, you just have to be able to show that. So, um, so these relationships between characters are really important. Um, another way if you collaborate is with eye contact, <coughs> hearing vocal colors, subtext, um, and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the ability to sense the vibrato. So, what is the vibrato? <laughs> it's uh, the vibration the voice produces. Very good. It's not a test. I mean, it's like, <laughs> uh, what's your vibrato like? Sing something. <laughs> a nice supported tone is going to have a little bit of a, a vibrato in it, a vibration. Um, the, you can also straighten that vibrato out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, here, do that again. Uh, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> so, that's just straightened out tone. Now, a conductor um, or a pianist, collaborative pianist, if they hear, like if they know the singer, they'll hear a regular vibrato. If a singer all of a sudden is under a little bit of duress, a little tired, hey, frap on ho, and they, they, they head for a note that doesn't quite work, you have to be there to immediately move forward. So that's a part of that interpersonal intelligence. And I'm telling you, it's one of the most remarkable, most fabulous, amazing things when it's there. And it's what kills a lot of operas when it's not there. Because <laughs> if it's not there, if it's just somebody down in the pit with their head down, conducting an orchestra without any regard, you know, what did Strauss say? You know, play louder, I can still hear the singers. Um, <laughs> if, it's just, if it's just that, there is no this. Uh, when I was a young conductor, I remember uh, I was conducting Hansel and Gretel, um, and it was not, it was maybe my 10th or 11th production, and the uh, general director of the company, she came over to me at the break, she said, so uh, I'm seeing a lot at the top of your head. That's not good. 
<laughs> because I was trying to show attention to the score. And, and I was like, oh yeah, but Hansel and Gretel are up there. They're lost in a forest and they need my help. Okay, I'll look up. Got it, here we are. Now I can get it. So um, this, this intelligence is, uh, is important. <laughs> um, so there we have, yes, a lovely conductor. Uh, Christopher Larkin and John Osborne and his wife Lynette Tapia singing in Frankfurt. Um, lots of interpersonal intelligence happening there, I'm sure. Then we have intrapersonal intelligence. This is Rebecca Woodmass acting and singing in Popea. Um, and uh, she's a little upset, I think. Yeah, she's very upset. This is um, where we get into the inside of the head. So Intra-personal intelligence is about self-awareness and self-knowledge. Psychiatrists need to have this. Um, uh, actors, of course, have this. This is where the acting component in opera really comes, comes into play. Um, understanding yourself, knowing who you are, um, what you can do, what you want to do, why you are motivated to do it. Understanding your own reactivity to outside forces and the ability to act on self-knowledge. And this is for both people. Because of course, operatic singers are slightly schizophrenic. They have themselves and their character at play. So when I talk about um, understanding yourself and knowing who you are and what you can do, what you want, yes, the person singing, Bruno, you need to know this. But your character also needs to know this. And sometimes the character wants something completely different. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's what, it's uh, being in our heads a little bit. Um, this is where we get into acting methods. Uh, Opera McGill um, and lots of training programs work on the acting. Sometimes the acting is worked on in productions when you're actually working through the rehearsal process. But um, there are a couple of different acting methods that, that are kind of known and are very useful. One of course is the method, which is uh, sensory uh, memory and uh, experiential memory. Um, and the emotional memory. That's uh, when you want to feel terrible, you remember something terrible, and you have a memory of it. Um, uh, you know, the, the old stereotypical example is uh, um, the difference between these methods was when Laurence Olivier um, and Dustin Hoffman were acting in the scene together, um, and uh, Dustin Hoffman was getting ready to be tortured by uh, the dentist, Laurence Olivier, in that movie. Uh, that I can't watch because I can't go to the dentist. Um, and uh, he was going to torture Dustin by like drilling into the teeth, you know, without Novocaine and to get uh, information out. So Hoffman stayed up like all night so he would be completely at wit's end. And uh, Laurence Olivier said, my, my man, why don't you just try acting next time? <laughs> um, and there we have it. The method is a great method. For opera singers, it's a little tricky. There are some opera singers who really swear by it, and at Juilliard Opera Center, I was trained, uh, Frank Cassaro, um, it was very much about the method, and um, singers would break down and cry if they were going to be in an emotional scene, and they would cry. But something happens to this, the voice box, when you cry. It rises. It goes up into the back of your throat. You can't sing opera with a larynx that's really high. So, Singers have to figure out how to create emotions without it affecting their throat. Um, they can do this uh, physically. There's a method, the Laban method, which is a way of um, kind of uh, recreating movement um, that direct, indirect things about it, about uh, heaviness, lightness, um, uh, walking sort of uh, in a heavy way, walking in, you know, in, a, in a light way, um, walking directly, indirectly, being quick being sustained. So that's a, a way of acting, actually, through just physicality. And then there's something called e-roots. Environment, relationships, objectives, obstacles, tactics, and stakes. It's a way of kind of character analysis. So they're going to look at an aria, like the Toreador aria, and they're going to think to themselves, what's the environment of this aria? Lilis Pastia's pub. <laughs> is it, is it uh, night? Is it day? It is evening. It is evening. Um, well, who's around you? Patrons of the bar, including Carmen. Including Carmen. Are they, are they uh, drunk? Are they reading poetry? Are they, like, 
They're having a good time. Yeah, it's a rowdy environment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the relationships, this relationship with Carmen, or the relationship actually with everybody in the room and you. Cause Basically, I am the hottest man in Seville. I am <laughs> the Toreador. Yes, you're, you are a celebrity. A, a huge celebrity in the town. Yeah. Like, okay. Yes. So the relationship between this Toreador and everybody else on the stage is very different than like, the relationship between Carmen and her friends. They all want you. Everybody does. Um, the objective, you come in to sing Votre Toast, <laughs> um, and uh, you're just wanting, I, I guess, people to have a good time? I mean, the objective of this aria is not necessarily always clear. <laughs> it's an introduction aria. So it's the first thing that happens for him. He walks onto the stage and sort of introduces himself through this piece. A lot of times, that's the objective. I think the subtextual objective is to get Carmen. Um, the obstacles. Obstacles are things that stand in the character's way. Um, you know, I, I, I want to love this woman, but her brother wants me dead. <laughs> He's an obstacle. My objective then might be to kill the brother. Um, tactics. Tactics are things that actors play with all the time. There's this, it's a wonderful thing that actors, actors get to do. They get to decide how they say their lines, how slowly they get to speak, how low they can speak, how high they can speak, how quickly they can speak. They can decide all of these factors. Opera singers can't. Opera singers, the composer, has decided the tactics for them. We have also, uh, opera composers decide environment a little bit, you know? That would be different kind of environment. Um, this environment. That's, there's an environment to that music. Um, you know, everybody. There's an environment there. Um, the, uh, the rhythm of the text, how quickly the tempo of the piece is played, that's mostly de uh, decided by a composer who's long dead most of the times. So the tactics, that's kind of hard for a singer to, to work through, but they have to make sense of it. And then we have stakes. What's at stake for this character if they don't get what they want? If I, if I don't get that woman to love me, then I will either kill myself, throw myself, um, kill everybody else. Um, <laughs> there's a, a lot of death in opera. Um, and uh, um, if I was the baritone, I'd probably be the, I'd probably be killed or be the person killing, yeah. most likely, yeah. The tenor dies a lot, soprano dies a lot. Um, mezzo stands around and watches it. Um, but uh, uh, what's at stake for these characters is, uh, is really at play there. Um, so here's a, a little bit of acting going on. Um, this is uh, 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 Jared, who is in Dido and Aeneas, uh, a Venus and Adonis, and uh, he's been injured by shrapnel um, and is bleeding. And uh, uh, that's at play. Um, this is a scene from Little Women. Beth is getting ready to die, and Joe's not happy about it. Um, and here we are with life and happiness. Um, the uh, So... These are just the elements <laughs> of a little teeny tiny moment. The musical, the linguistic, the mathematical logical, then the kinesthetic, the spatial, uh, remembering it's acoustic as well as kind of physical space, um, the interpersonal and intrapersonal uh, thoughts that are happening um, in one little moment for one, uh, one aria in opera. This is... Uh, a way of looking at how to create a performance. Um, so that when a student says, hey, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn an aria from Lucia de Lammermoor, that they are thinking not just, okay, how does the music go? How, does, how do these notes go? How is it gonna sound in my voice? They actually have to go through all of these intelligences, particularly once they get to the stage. And then they hold on to them in bits and pieces. Your mind is not always on all of them at once, right? No, <laughs> no not at all. Um, just like right now, your mind has not been on the fact that you needed to sing the Torre Adora. You've been 
thinking about other things. So now we're going to go back to that, um, and you're going to uh, sing it for me again. Okay? So we're going to sit up a little bit. <laughs> we're going to work on our posture. We're going to take a good breath. I'm going to go one, two, three, and we're all going to breathe on four. Okay? And then we're going to sing it. One, two, three, breathe. He takes, off, he takes over after that. Um, that's just the little teeny tiny um, bit of that. So we'll put that all together. I'll look at you, I'll raise my hand, and when it comes time, you'll sing. And this is now Bruno Hua singing Escamillo's aria from Carmen. Um, and uh, it's not a test for him, but you, you can judge him about how many intelligences he might be you know, <laughs> in the midst of. You think, ah, oh, I only saw two. I, well, oh, there we go, there's one. So we'll see how you do. Yes. Señor, señor, cara le sola. Oui, le torero peut s'entendre pour plaisir, pour plaisir, ils ont les combats. Le cirque est plat, c'est jour de fête. Le cirque est plat du haut en bas. Les spectateurs perdent la tête. Les spectateurs sont Apostrophe, crise ta page. Poussez jusqu'à la fureur. Car c'est la fête du courage. C'est la fête des gens de cœur. Allons, prends garde. Allons, allons. Bien, oui, songe en combattant. Qu'un œil noir te regarde et que l'amour t'attend. Toréador, l'amour, l'amour t'attend.
Thank you. Thank you.